about development and pregnancy. And if you guys ever get a chance to take a class on development, they're actually really interesting classes. We're gonna obviously have to do a very general overview <coughs> because in order to go into what's going on with development, there would be a lot of new terminology that we're gonna have to learn. And we just don't have the time to do that. So we're gonna kind of skim over it. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna basically come back here and see what happens during fertilization on a cellular level. And then once we have our zygote, then we're gonna see how that zygote turns into an embryo and how it implants and kind of what's going on. And then we get a fetus and then eventually we get a baby out of that. And they break down these different stages Generally, you'll see, most folks will call it an embryo from the time that you have fertilization up to about eight weeks. Other books will separate out this phase and call the pre-embryo fertilization stage two weeks after fertilization and then embryo from week three to week eight. The big dividing point is here between the embryo and then the fetus. The fetus will be from nine weeks till delivery. And we'll look and see kind of what happens during those periods, how you go from a zygote to an embryo, then to a fetus. So remember that in terms of fertilization, the oocyte, remember it's a secondary oocyte halted at metaphase two, is gonna be released from the ovary and get swept up into the fallopian tubes. That oocyte will be viable for about a day about 24 hours. Then the sperm, they can last a little bit longer. So the sperm are viable up to about 72 hours. And the sperm can stick around a little bit longer because they're gonna utilize not only the fructose that's in the semen that they're traveling in, but they're also gonna utilize the nutrients that are being excreted or secreted from the uterine tubes and then the uterus as they're traveling that way. So they can last a little bit longer. So fertilization, remember, is when that sperm is gonna penetrate that secondary oocyte halted at metaphase two. And at that point, we don't have a zygote yet. That's not the moment of conception. That's fertilization. And then, that sperm being inside of that secondary oocyte that's halted at metaphase two is gonna trigger a series of chemical reactions that's gonna cause that secondary oocyte to finish meiosis two. And when it finishes meiosis two, it becomes an ovum. And at that point, the chromosomes can then mix. And that's the moment of conception. And that's when you get a zygote. So, big misconception that as soon as fertilization occurs, that's the moment of conception. It actually takes a few more hours for that to occur. About 12 hours or so, maybe a little less, but about 12 hours, and then you get a zygote. Now, let's see, could we talk, oh, okay. So in terms of the sperm, remember that the sperm, we streamlined that sperm so that really all that the sperm is contributing to the zygote are those chromosomes. That's really all it's going to contribute because we got rid of most of its organelles, most of its cytoplasm. So really we've got 23 chromosomes that the sperm is contributing. And then the female, the ovum, will then contribute 23 chromosomes plus all of the uh, organelles and all of the <coughs> cytoplasm for that zygote so that we have a big enough cell that we can then undergo mitosis. Take that zygote and make it start dividing and producing more and more cells. Now, fertilization generally is going to occur between the ampulla and the isthmus of the uterine tube. But almost always it's going to be in the uterine tube. That's where you want fertilization to <coughs> And for sperm, it's gonna take sperm about 30 minutes to two hours once it reaches the vagina to get up to those uterine tubes. And remember, the sperm are getting up there a few different ways. One, they're going to use their flagella, 
powered by ATP using that fructose. They're going to use that flagella to swim, but if they were just using the flagella, it would take them much, much longer than this to get there. So not only are they using their flagella, but they're also using the <coughs> prostaglandins that are in the semen to make the smooth muscle of the female reproductive tract contract. And that sets up peristalsis and it helps to move that sperm in a forward direction. And then cilia, the cilia that are in the fallopian tubes, right around ovulation, that cilia starts to beat and that cilia is helping the sperm move to that oocyte. Now the oocyte doesn't travel very far. It's traveling just a little bit through the fallopian tubes. It's really the sperm that has to get up there and meet with that oocyte. So you've got around 200 million sperm, give or take, um, that enter the vagina. About 10,000 actually get up to the uterine tubes. And then fewer than, this says fewer than 100 actually reach the oocyte. Um, this number will vary. I've seen it up to like 1,000 will get up actually to the oocyte. So along the way, you've got some sperm that are just dying off because they just you know, they can't make that long journey. Other ones just never get through the cervix. They get stuck in all the mucus. Some get stuck in the uterus because the uterus is kind of big for a little sperm. And then you've got, you know, 10,000 or so that actually get into the fallopian tubes. And then they have to get into the right fallopian tube, the one where there is an egg present. So you can see that very few are actually reaching that new site. But you've got to have, again, it depends on the book that you read. Um, and I've seen anywhere from 10 to a couple hundred. You need about 10 to a couple hundred sperm to actually get to that oocyte. Because those sperm have to start penetrating the walls that are around that oocyte. So when you get the sperm engaging with the oocyte, the acrosomes on the sperm are going to break and out comes a bunch of digestive enzymes. And those digestive enzymes are going to start breaking down the outer areas of that oocyte. So when you look up there, you've got the oocyte halted at metaphase two, and around it you have what's called the zona pellucida, which is a uh, glycogen-rich layer around the oocyte. And then outside of that, you have a layer of cells called the corona radiata. And that's what those sperm have to break through. They have to break through that corona radiata. And so you're going to have many sperm that are releasing their acrosomes, releasing those digestive enzymes. And those digestive enzymes are breaking through the corona radiata and then in getting through this um, uh, zona pellucida layer, and you're going to have one sperm that has its intact acrosome that actually makes it all the way into the oocyte. So it's all of the other guys that are releasing their digestive enzymes are basically laying down a path so that one sperm with its intact acrosome can actually make it in. Yeah. Yeah. Is it just by chance that the sperm is from this one? Yeah, it's just completely by chance. Yeah, completely by chance. Um, and once that happens, once the sperm with its intact acrosome gets into that zona pellucida layer, that glycogen protein, the glycoprotein rich region, then there's a, several things that are going to happen. First thing that's going to happen is the sperm is actually going to bind to a sperm receptor that's located in that region. And that's why that sperm has to have an intact acrosome. If it doesn't, it <coughs> can't bind to that receptor. Now, once you get the sperm binding to that receptor, then the acrosome will rupture and the enzymes will digest a path actually into that oocyte. And then that's going to trigger the oocyte to finish meiosis two, And also, once that sperm enters into the oocyte and the oocyte starts to become activated, starts to finish meiosis two, 
you also have a series of events that occur that basically prevent any other sperm from being able to enter into that goose site. Any other sperm receptors that are in that zona pellucidum layer, they basically become inactive so that no other sperm can come in because you don't want to have multiple sperm fertilizing one egg because then you would have way too many chromosomes and that zygote would die off very quickly. You can't have that many chromosomes in a, in a cell. So once you get that oocyte finishing meiosis two, then the chromosomes mix, you get a zygote that's formed, and then mitosis begins automatically with that zygote. Now, <clears throat> once we have that zygote formed, then we're going to start the pregnancy phase of things. And we're going to see that pregnancy is divided up into three trimesters. The first trimester, you've got that zygote, and that zygote is going to turn into a multicellular structure. And from that, then we're going to form an embryo from it. And that embryo then is going to ultimately turn into a fetus. And during those, that first trimester, that's when we're going to give orientation to this embryo. We're going to give a superior and an inferior side, a medial and a lateral side, a superficial and a deep side to it. We're also going to set up certain types of tissue, embryonic tissue, that ultimately will give rise to certain organ systems. And then organ systems are going to start to form. So all of that's happening in the first trimester. So the first trimester, there are a lot of very intricate cellular activities that are taking place. And this is why the first trimester is a really important time. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't even realize they're pregnant during a fair chunk of that first trimester. Now, by the time that we finish the first trimester, we'll have all of the major organ systems, at least the tissue that will become those organ systems, is all laid out. It's where it's supposed to be, and now we just have to develop those organ systems. And that's what's going to take place in the second trimester. Here, we're going to develop all those organs and all of the organ systems. They're going to start to work during this second trimester. You're going to see the body shape and proportions change a lot in that second trimester. Initially, that embryo is going to look very much like, like a, a fish almost. And by the time you get to the end of the second trimester, that fetus is going to look distinctly human. It's going to start having the right proportions. You're going to start to see you know, the major organs functional. You're going to see the limbs. The tail that would have formed in the first trimester will have regressed. You get gill-like structures that form, and they will have regressed, and you'll get lungs that develop in place of it. So if you look in terms of evolution, most organisms are going to go through a period of time where they look similar to one another. So again, humans will have these gill-like structures, they'll have a tail, and as that embryo and then fetus develops, those things will start to regress because obviously you're not going to end up with those structures once you get a baby that's produced. In the third trimester, this is really just about increasing the size of everything, just rapid fetal growth, making everything that you've already laid down and is functional, you're just going to make it bigger. That's really what's happening in the third trimester. You're going to start laying down a lot of adipose tissue, and by early in the third trimester, late in the second, early in the <coughs> third, really all of your major organ systems are fully functional, with a couple exceptions. Mm -hmm. What's the one organ system that's not going to be functional? Is that yes. one? The respiratory system won't. And then the, no, well, that's the major one. The respiratory system won't be fully functional. And that's because we're not going to take in any air into those lungs until that baby's born. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to focus on the first trimester and we're going to look because there are some really distinct, important phases that happen in the first trimester. So we're going to look at that. Again, second trimester is just about <coughs> developing those organ systems. Third trimester is about everything getting bigger. So when we look at the first trimester, we've got this zygote that has formed. Okay? And now what's going to happen is that zygote is going to start to go through mitosis. And remember with mitosis, you go through rounds of cell division where you have a parent cell that's diploid, meaning that it has 46 chromosomes. And it's going to go through mitosis and it's going to produce two daughter cells that look genetically identical to that original cell. So the 46 chromosomes that are in that parent cell, the daughters will have those same exact 46 chromosomes. Okay. Now, as the zygote is undergoing mitosis, every time it goes through a round of mitosis, you get a new structure that forms. So as we go through these doubling of cells, they have new names, and we're not going to learn every single name as we go through these doubling of cells. But the zygote is going to become what's called a pre-embryo. That's where the one cell becomes two. These rounds of cell division are taking place in about 12 hours or so. So every round of cell division is about 12 hours in length. Now, we're going to eventually get a multicellular complex, so a group of cells that are organized into a hollow ball, basically. And that's called our blastocyst. And this structure is important because it's this structure that's going to implant into the uterus. Now, as I come over here, and look at this for a second. So if fertilization happens about here in the fallopian tubes, then Every 12 hours or so, we're going to get a doubling of our cells. And as those structures are undergoing mitosis, they're moving towards the uterus, or at least that's what they should be doing, moving towards the uterus. So that by the time that we get our blastocyst, it is down here in the uterus and it's ready to implant. Now, when we look at this blastocyst, so this would be an early blastocyst, this is a slightly later blastocyst. Again, it's a hollow ball, it's cells that have, have gone together to make up this hollow ball, and the outer part of that ball is called the tropoblast. It's just a layer of cells on the outermost part of that ball called the tropoblast. And it's the tropoblast that is providing nutrients and protection to the group of cells that are inside of that hollow ball. And the group of cells that are in that hollow ball, you can see them up here, they're called the inner cell mass. And it's those cells of the inner cell mass that ultimately will become the embryo. So the tropoblast is surrounding it, protecting that group of cells, providing nutrients for that group of cells. And the inner cell mass will become the um, embryo. Okay. Now, this whole process of undergoing rounds of cell division from the zygote to the blastocyst, that's called cleavage. And that's the first thing that happens after fertilization. And again, this is all taking place in the first trimester. So fertilization happens first, then you form a zygote, then that zygote undergoes rounds of cell division as it moves towards the uterus. That process is called cleavage. By the time that we get to the uterus, we should have our blastocyst ready to implant into the uterus. Now, for that blastocyst to be able to implant into the uterus, we need to have a nice thick layer of endometrium here in the uterus. And that's why it's so important that the uterine cycle matches up with the ovarian cycle. So that when we undergo ovulation, 
the uterus is well on its way to preparing itself in case we do have fertilization and about a week later we potentially are going to have implantation occurring. So that process of cleavage is taking about a week or so. Now, next thing that's going to happen is implantation. And up here it says completed 14 days after ovulation. Okay, so remember, we have ovulation, and then we've got seven days or so, seven, more than that, 28 days, about 10 days in the cycle, and then to finish the cycle, and then cleavage takes, you know, about a week, maybe a little bit less. So implantation is happening about 14 days after ovulation, or about a week, give or take a couple days, after fertilization occurs. And it depends on when fertilization actually occurs. And with implantation, what's going to happen is that blastocyst is going to orient itself so that the um, part of the blastocyst where the inner cell mass is located is going to orient itself towards the endometrium. So let me just look at this. If this is the endometrium here, that blastocyst will orient itself so that the area where the inner cell mass is will be closest to the endometrium. And what happens during this implantation is this structure here, the blastocyst, will start to invade maternal structures, start to invade that endometrium. And again, we're not going to talk about all the different structures that form in the process, but these cells here are going to start dividing, undergoing mitosis, and they're going to start invading here and attaching into the endometrium. Now, the uterus, not only does it have that nice thick endometrium, but remember that we said in the end of the cycle, the uterine cycle, was the secretory phase, which we're still in at this point, we're secreting a lot of nutrients. And we've got glycogen-rich secretions that are supporting all of these cells of that blastocyst. Now, the inner cell mass at some point is going to separate from the tropoblast so that we get an embryo that will form from that inner cell mass. The space that's in that hollow blastocyst will ultimately form the amniotic cavity and that will fill with fluid. Now, also, <coughs> what's going to happen is something called gastrulation. And gastrulation is going to be happening during implantation. So as this blastocyst is invading and attaching to the endometrium, that inner cell mass is dividing and um, maturing, if you will, to become an embryo. And you're going to get this phase called gastrulation occurs, where what you're going to get in that embryo are three distinct layers of cells, or they're called germ layers, or embryonic layers. And those three layers are the ectoderm, the endoderm, and the mesoderm. And these three layers ultimately will give rise to certain organs. So the ectoderm, this will, as it divides and differentiates, during this first trimester, early first trimester, it will start to form the structures of the nervous system and the epidermis of the skin. That endoderm layer, this will ultimately form all of the epithelial linings inside of our body, of the digestive tract, the respiratory tract, the reproductive tract, the urinary tract. The mesoderm is going to form most of the other tissues. So almost all of the muscle comes from these mesodermal layers. Um, cartilage will come from this. A lot of your connective tissues will come from the mesoderm. Now, come back here for a second. Just to back up for a moment. Atopic pregnancies. This is a term that gets thrown around a lot. 
in any atopic pregnancy refers to when the blastocyst does not implant into the endometrium. And it could be implanting anywhere other than the endometrium. That's referred to as an atopic pregnancy. So what can happen, we come back here, what can happen is, actually, this, um, these cells, or these groupings of cells, don't move down to the uterus fast enough. And so they may only make it, let's say, to here when we get a blastocyst forming. And once we get a blastocyst form, there are various genes that turn on that basically tell that structure implant, just implant wherever you are. And so that's how you can get a blastocyst implanting into the fallopian tubes. And obviously that's not going to be successful because that blastocyst will start to implant into the fallopian tubes. It will continue growing, forming an embryo, and eventually it's going to put a lot of pressure on this small tube. And if you don't catch it, usually you feel the pain as when you go in and get it checked out. But if you don't catch it early enough, then potentially that fallopian tube could rupture. And obviously that's very dangerous because as that implantation is occurring, there are a lot of blood vessels that are forming. A lot of vascular components are forming during implantation. So if this ruptures, you can have a lot of bleeding that occurs. The other kind of, I don't want to say common, but the other place that you hear of atopic pregnancies, usually you hear of them in the fallopian tube. But where they also can occur is out in the abdominal cavity. So what can happen is you get this zygote that forms, and instead of traveling this way as it undergoes cleavage, it travels this way as it undergoes cleavage. And it could end up out here coming out the fimbri of the fallopian tube and end up out here in the abdominal cavity. And then it will attach to, could attach to anything, could attach to your intestines, could attach to the wall of your abdominal cavity, could attach to any of those organs in there. And again, the big problem with that is, out here, you may not notice the pain as quickly as you might notice it here, because this is a confined space, you're gonna activate pain receptors really fast there. Out in here, you may not notice it as quickly, it may grow larger, and then if it ruptures, you're gonna have even more blood vessels that are rupturing, and that could be life-threatening. So those kind of areas are where you generally see the atopic pregnancies occurring. Are you still um, test positive on a pregnancy test? Are your hormone levels still going to be where they're supposed to? That's yeah, okay. you sh yeah, you should. You should test positive. Yeah. All of that should be the same because that will be coming from the corpus luteum in the ovary. Yeah, so that should all be the same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's making the egg move, or the oocyte, like what's propelling it to move in one direction? Most of it's cilia. The okay. cilia that's lining this is the, is really what's causing it to move, is the cilia. Yeah. Can another body reject the blastocyst, or would that happen? It could, yeah. Yeah, some, you'll hear of uteruses not being um, a hospitable environment. Right, you'll hear that sometimes. <laughs> and a lot of what that means is the endometrium doesn't get thick enough or the hormone, the like progesterone levels don't stay high enough to keep that endometrium thick. And it could just kind of kick it out. Yeah. But would the immune system ever go through the oh, uh, You know, I'm not sure. I wouldn't be surprised, but I can't say 100%. I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised if there have been cases where macrophages came in and attacked it for some reason. Mm -hmm. No, I think it would, my, my guess would be that there might be something wrong with the structure that is then putting out a particular protein or glycoprotein on the surface mm -hmm. that then tells the macrophage, hey, you know, target this. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know, I'm kind of guessing on that point. I'm not sure. Isn't that what happens with the RH releases? Um, like the blood 
blood exposure. For hemolytic like, disease of the newborn, is that what you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, like post-pregnancy factor. Um, so with, with that, what's happening is <clears throat> There you're having antibodies that the mom made previously enter into the fetal circuit. So this wouldn't happen at this point because we don't have blood that's formed yet and we don't have blood vessels. Okay. <coughs> so that wouldn't happen at this point, but it could happen later when we have you know, blood cells actually being produced and then there would be an Rh antigen to be targeted. At this point, we don't have anything like that yet. It's way too early. The cells haven't, cells haven't, um, how do I say it? Um, they haven't matured enough yet to actually be producing those types of antigens. Okay, so after we implant, then we're gonna start to form a placenta. And this is, <coughs> these different phases at this point are overlapping. So we are forming, we formed our embryo at this point. That embryo is continuing to grow. Those different germ layers are differentiating and developing into actual organs. And while that's happening, we're gonna form a placenta. And remember, it takes about three months to form a placenta. But what we're gonna do is form this structure that is going to allow gases and nutrients and waste to be exchanged between mom's circulation and then the embryonic and then fetal circulation. And so we're gonna have blood vessels that are coming down. We're gonna have the umbilical cord that is literally connecting the placenta and the fetus. And then blood is gonna flow to the placenta through paired umbilical arteries and then blood will flow away from the placenta via a single umbilical vein. And so keep in mind that mom's blood and the baby or the fetal blood, it doesn't mix. It stays in its own blood vessels. And then certain things can cross, cross just like they would cross at capillaries, like we talked about in our system. So things like glucose would be able to cross, oxygen, carbon dioxide, various organic wastes, amino acids, fats. Some antibodies can cross, like the Rh antibody. Other antibodies can't cross, um, so it just depends. But generally, cells are not going to be crossing. So you don't have blood cells going from one to the other. They're staying in their own structures. Now, once you get that placenta form, it's going to not only be this organ that allows gases and nutrients and waste to be exchanged, but it's also an endocrine organ, so it's gonna secrete hormones as well. I don't understand how the um, blood flow happens. Okay. So is it like circular that it's coming, that it's going through the umbilical cord, through the baby, and the vein comes out and hits like the wall and that's where the gas exchange happens? I'm, I'm not understanding okay, how they so don't Okay, so the placenta will be like this, okay? And blood's gonna flow to the placenta through umbilical arteries. And that's mom's? These would be, this is mom's blood, yeah. This would be mom's blood. And then here in the placenta, these arteries are gonna come in and branch and then the fetal vessels will basically come in here and they'll branch and this allows exchange to happen right here. So things from mom's blood can go into that fetal blood and things from the fetal blood can go into mom's blood. And then in mom's system, the blood leaves the placenta via the umbilical vein. So, the placenta is secreting a variety of hormones. These are just a few. So it's gonna secrete what's called HCG, and this is gonna help to maintain the corpus luteum. Once we get the placenta fully formed, however, then the corpus luteum can go away. And this is what they usually are using to test to see if you're pregnant. Corpus luteum can secrete this hormone early, Later, the placenta can secrete it, 
and it helps to maintain that structure until we get the placenta fully formed. We've got um, a prolactin-like hormone that's secreted from the placenta, and this gets the breast tissue ready for milk production. During pregnancy, you're not producing true the milk that you're going to produce after the pregnancy, but you're getting those glands increasing in size, getting them to start on the road to making milk, but they're not here, there yet. They're going to need prolactin that comes from your posterior, sorry, anterior pituitary to do that. The placenta is going to secrete relaxin. And this is going to be important later in the pregnancy, around the time of delivery. What relaxin is going to do is it's going to increase the flexibility of the pubic synthesis. Remember, that's a type of joint between the two pubic bones. There's a piece of cartilage there. And relaxin will basically <coughs> cause that connective tissue of the cartilage to loosen up. And that allows the hips to be able to expand a little bit to make it easier for the, the fetus to come out. Relaxin will also dilate the cervix. So as you're getting closer and closer to labor, the cervix starts to dilate. And before you start pushing, you're gonna want that cervix to be 10 centimeters. 10 centimeters, 10 centimeters, 10 centimeters. So relaxin will get it started, start to dilate it, and then as the fetus kind of shifts and starts putting weight on the cervix and the cervix starts to stretch, that in combination with this hormone increasing as we get close to labor will cause that cervix to completely dilate. Relaxin will also suppress the release of oxytocin. Now this is going to be important because we want some of these things to start to happen as we get close to labor, but we don't want labor to happen yet. And oxytocin is going to cause the smooth muscle of the uterus to contract. And we don't want that to happen yet. <clears throat> Progesterone, remember, is released from the corpus luteum. Once the placenta takes over, it will start secreting progesterone. And we want progesterone levels to be high because we want to keep the endometrium nice and thick. If the endometrium sloughs off because progesterone levels drop, then we can have a miscarriage. So we're gonna keep that nice and thick. The other thing is progesterone inhibits those uterine contractions. And again, we don't want the uterus contracting until we're ready for delivery. As the uterus is getting um, larger, as the pregnancy develops and the uterus gets bigger, those smooth muscle cells are being stretched and their inherent um, reaction is to contract and we don't want that to happen. So keeping progesterone levels high keeps those uh, uterine, um, the uterine myom or the myometrium from contracting. Now, placenta will also release estrogen. Now, estrogen levels will stay, you know, kind of not too high, not too low during most of the pregnancy. As we get towards the third trimester and closer to labor, estrogen levels will start to rise, and that's going to be driven by the placenta. And that's going to be important because as those estrogen levels start to rise, it's going to start to trigger various events that are ultimately going to bring on labor can bring on those contractions. Now, in terms of a placenta, so um, Dennis, this is kind of um, a schematic. So what we've got here, the, this would be mom's maternal blood, and then you've got the fetal blood um, kind of in here, and this is where exchange can happen. So these are basically like really leaky capillaries all throughout this placenta. And it's going to allow an exchange between the fetus and mom's system while still keeping the blood in separate vessels. So that's kind of what's going on there with the placenta. And blood would be coming in through umbilical arteries, and then they don't show it, but leading through an umbilical. Go 
umbilical arteries, umbilical veins right there. Now, also in the first trimester, we kind of mentioned this already, we're forming an embryo. And if embryogenesis are forming this embryo, again, this is coming from the inner cell mass of the blastula that implanted into the endometrium. And then as those different germ layers, the ectoderm, the mesoderm, the endoderm, as they start dividing and differentiating, you're gonna get genes that are turning on that say, okay, these group of cells here in the ectoderm, you're going to become neurons. And I'm kind of oversimplifying. But you'll start to have genes being turned on or turned off in certain groups of cells and that's going to drive the formation of the major organs and the organ systems. By the time that you hit week eight, which is really pretty early if you think about it, you have your organ systems are recognizable in terms of those cells are grouped together. You've got the right genes being turned on or turned off that allow various <coughs> organs and the parts of the organs to form. <coughs> and this is all going to take place shortly after gastrulation. So to make an embryo, you first have to have those germ layers. You have to have the ectoderm, the mesoderm, the endoderm, and then from there you can get groups of cells dividing, differentiating, and becoming these major organ systems or organs. Also during this period, you've got a group of genes called, what are they called? Um, the Hox genes. And they are going to start to set up dorsal versus ventral surfaces, right and left sides, superior, inferior. And these genes are very important because it's letting these other cells know where they're supposed to go. This is how you make sure that you don't end up with your heart on the outside of the body. You've got to have these body orientation or these axes set up, and then the cells know, oh, they're supposed to migrate over to this particular quadrant or to this particular area. And then once they get there, they can start dividing, differentiating, turning on other genes or turning off other genes to become a particular type of cell or type of organ. So, and then second trimester, third trimester. So we want to kind of back up and say, what's happening? Is that clock right? Eight fifteen. Yep. Okay. So uh, we want to say, what's happening to mom in all this? Because obviously, there's a lot of things happening to mom's body while all this is going on. So obviously, as that fetus starts to grow, mom's going to have to. She's going to have to breathe for two, she has to eat for two, she has to excrete for two. The thing to keep in mind is mom is not breathing, eating, excreting for an organism the size of herself. So you don't need to double your calories, right? You don't need to double everything, okay? You just need to increase things, but not double them. So. In terms of early in the pregnancy, having those high estrogen and progesterone levels, this is generally what makes women very nauseous that first trimester. So if you think about the ovarian and the uterine cycles, usually women are experiencing low levels of these hormones and then high levels, then low levels and high levels, but they kind of fluctuate throughout the month. If pregnancy occurs, then progesterone levels are staying elevated for an extended period of time. Estrogen levels are staying kind of high as well. And so the, there's various receptors that are getting activated because of these high hormone levels. And that can set up reflexes that cause nausea or vomiting to occur. Now usually what happens is over time, within a couple weeks, or certainly within the first three months, you'll start to become less sensitive to those hormone levels. They're still there, 
you're just not initiating that reflex as easily. And so usually people are sick the first you know couple weeks or first couple months, and then that goes away. Respiratory rate obviously has to increase, which means that your base tidal volume will increase. Now remember that your total lung capacity is not increasing. So if your tidal volume is increasing, your in, out, in, out is increasing, that means that your IRV and your ERV actually decrease. The maximum that you can inhale past normal will decrease because total lung capacity is not changing, right? You're not getting bigger, your lungs aren't getting bigger. Maternal blood volume ramps up and it can increase by 50%. And this is one of the main reasons that a lot of women that are pregnant have problems with their blood pressure. Just think if you stick 50% more blood in your blood vessels, your blood pressure is going to rise. Okay? That means that you're going to have an increase in EPO because if you're increasing blood volume, you've got to make more red blood cells. You're making 50% more red blood cells. You're increasing your renin and aldosterone levels as well. And this can also increase your blood pressure. Now, nutrient requirements obviously are going to increase by about 10 to 30 percent. Your glomerular filtration rate, if your blood volume increases by 50 percent, then the rate that you are filtering your blood at the kidneys has to also increase by 50 percent. And this is one of the major reasons that pregnant women are urinating so frequently, because they literally are producing more filtrate and the uterus is pressing down on the bladder, and so the bladder is essentially smaller. You can't hold as much. So you can't hold as much, but you're producing a lot more urine, so you're going to be urinating very, very frequently. Obviously, the uterus is going to increase in size. The breast tissue also will increase in size. And as the pregnancy continues, then the secretory activity of that tissue will also increase to prepare for milk production. Now, when we look at the uterus, so when we look at the uterus, it's going to contain about two liters of fluid plus the placenta plus the fetus. And the placenta is about the size of the fetus. They're more or less kind of equal. The fetus might be a little bit bigger, but they're really kind of similar in terms of size. And if you just think about that, that's a lot of extra stuff to be carrying around on the anterior part of your body. It's a lot of extra stuff. So all of that together, you know, about 15 or so pounds. If you look at the uterus, so this is the space that the uterus is taking up before conception. And you can see by the time that you hit nine months, how much space the uterus is taking up. And so you can imagine that the diaphragm sits right here. That uterus is pressing on the diaphragm that makes it harder to breathe, right? You want the diaphragm to contract and dome, flatten out that dome. It's hard to do that when the uterus is right there. So breathing becomes challenging. The intestines have to get pushed off to the side. The stomach, you can see where a female would have a lot of um, gastric reflux because you're pressing on the stomach those gastric juices are going to go back up into the esophagus so you have a lot of heartburn um, and you can imagine the bladder sitting here being pressed on so the uterus is expanding greatly in size and so again those muscle cells of the uterus they are increasing in size as well. They are undergoing hypertrophy. They're getting bigger in size. Remember, muscle cells don't really divide. Muscle cells very rarely divide. So they're getting bigger. Now that increased stretching again leads to a spontaneous reflex from those muscle cells to contract. And that's absolutely what you don't want to have happen. So you've got to have several things in place to keep the uterus from contracting because that could lead to a miscarriage if it happens early. Um, one of the major things that's going to prevent the uterus from contracting, progesterone. Pro 
progesterone inhibits those contractions. So even though the inherent property of those muscle cells when they're stretched is to contract, the fact that progesterone is there he helps to keep that from happening. Now, progesterone is going to be opposed by rising estrogen levels. As we get closer to delivery, the placenta is going to start releasing more and more estrogen. And those estrogen levels are going to start to antagonize the effects of progesterone. Because as we get close to delivery, once delivery happens, we want that uterine muscle to start to contract. Oxytocin levels will start to rise because the estrogen levels are rising. <clears throat> High estrogen levels are going to trigger oxytocin levels to start to rise. And the stretching of the cervix. As the cervix stretches, that sets up a reflex that goes up to the hypothalamus and causes it to make more oxytocin that's released from the posterior pituitary. Right, posterior pituitary. I gotta review my hormones. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so that's gonna cause oxytocin levels to increase, the stretching of the cervix. And we said the cervix starts to stretch because relaxin coming from the placenta starts to increase. And as all that weight sits on the cervix, it will start to stretch as well. Prostaglandin production will start to happen from the uterus itself, and that's due to estrogen rising and oxytocin. Estrogen and oxytocin can target the uterus, and that will cause the uterus to start making more prostaglandins. And we said that prostaglandins cause muscle cells to contract. So all of this is happening as we get closer and closer to delivery so that the effects of progesterone inhibiting those contractions become less and less and less. And this is why as you get close to labor, even though labor hasn't started, if you get close to the end of your pregnancy, you can get false contractions occurring. And that's because all of this stuff is starting to occur. You can get false contractions. Now, what is a true contraction versus a false contraction? False contractions are spasming in the myometrium of the uterus. And again, it's happening because the uterus is stretching. We're starting to inhibit all those effects of progesterone, all the inhibitory effects. So oxytocin levels rising, estrogen levels rising, prostaglandins levels rising. That's causing these spasmings to occur. We can't inhibit that from happening. But false contractions are neither regular nor are they persistent. They will stop, okay? Seems like they won't stop, but they will stop. True contractions is once we set up a positive feedback loop, once true contractions start, they are not gonna stop until we have delivery. So this is a biochemical and mechanical event that is, once we start it, we can't stop it. It's like pulling the trigger on that gun. Once you do it, that bullet's gonna go, you can't stop it. Now, if you're in the hospital, obviously they can give you drugs to decrease the effects, but once true labor starts, we're going to finish it out. And a positive feedback loop is gonna get set up, and we're gonna keep increasing the intensity of those contractions until labor is completed, and then negative feedback will bring it all back down to baseline. So, so what's so happening? Those after labor? After labor. After labor. Wait, say it one more time. Active labor? Active labor, so true labor, active labor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, setting up true labor. So, first of all, we said that oxytocin levels will start to rise in mom. And oxytocin levels will start to rise because estrogen levels are starting to rise. That will make the uterus more sensitive to oxytocin, and that will cause more oxytocin to be released, rising estrogen levels. Also, the cervix stretching will set up a reflex that causes more oxytocin to be released. 
Now the fetus also is releasing oxytocin. So the fetus has some say so into when labor is gonna happen. So the fetus will start to release oxytocin as well. That will all target the uterus and cause the uterus to start to contract. Now let's just look over here, estrogen. Estrogen's coming from the ovary. <coughs> it's also coming from the placenta. And estrogen will come down here and at the uterus, it will actually cause the uterus to make more oxytocin receptors. So it makes the uterus more sensitive to oxytocin. So as those estrogen levels start to rise, the estrogen is telling the uterus, hey, make more oxytocin receptors. Remember, estrogen is a steroid hormone. It can enter into the cells of the myometrium. It can activate oxytocin receptor genes and cause <coughs> oxytocin receptors to form. Uterus becomes more sensitive to oxytocin. Then oxytocin levels start to increase and the uterus is more sensitive. Uterus starts to contract. That sets up a feedback. The more that the uterus contracts, that activates receptors, that sends a message up to the hypothalamus, <coughs> tells the hypothalamus make more oxytocin. More oxytocin comes down here, makes the uterus contract even more, activates those <coughs> stretch receptors, sends a stronger stimulus up to the hypothalamus, make more oxytocin, so on and so forth. Remember we said also the uterus is making prostaglandins. The placenta also can be making prostaglandins. That causes the uterus to contract even stronger. So we have several things happening that are making the uterus contract harder and harder and harder. And that sets up our pregnancy or our delivery at that point. Now, different stages of labor. You're basically three stages of labor. First stage is called the dilation stage. And this is when true labor starts. That begins the dilation stage. <coughs> and here you've got the cervix is starting to dilate. It may be a little bit dilated at the beginning of this stage and you want it to increase um, its dilation throughout the stage. Some women, this is a short stage. For a lot of women, this can be a very long stage. Some women, this can take you know, a day sometimes. It can be a very long phase. So early in this stage, the fetus is going to shift down into the cervical canal. And that's going to help the cervix to also dilate. That's also going to, when the cervix starts dilating, it causes more oxytocin to be released. So it gets the whole process started. Now, you can you can literally see when that shift happens, you can see it in the belly. You can see the, the fetus kind of dropping down a little bit. It looks different, kind of goes a little bit further away from the diaphragm. Now, when this happens, you want that fetus to be with its head facing inferior. <coughs> you don't want it to be breech where the head is not the most inferior, and we'll talk about why in a second. In terms of contractions, they can last up to about half a minute. They're coming every 10 to 30 minutes, and throughout this stage, the frequency is going to increase. But generally, they say, you know, don't go into the hospital until they're coming five minutes apart. You know, it just depends. There's a lot of different avenues that you can have children today, so. That's something that you would have to talk with your doctor or your <coughs> midwife or nurse practitioner, whoever's going to do the, the pregnancy or the labor. But late in this stage is generally when the water will break. And so at this point, the amniotic fluid comes out. And usually, if you're in a hospital setting and your water breaks, they're going to want the the delivery to kind of speed up a little bit. And one of the things you have to be careful of if the water breaks is if you are in, let's say, a hospital setting and they're monitoring the fetus. So they're going in 
you know, and they're putting a little heart monitor, whatever kind of monitor on the, on the fetus. Every time they go up that vaginal canal, if the water has already broke, then that fetus is at risk for any infection. Now, obviously, you're going to use sterile technique when that happens, but anytime you're going up into the vagina and that fetus is not protected by that bag, by that amniotic fluid, then it's at risk for infection. If you're not going up through the vaginal canal, then this really is not such a major concern. But this is why if you are in that kind of setting, they tend to want to move the labor along at that point. Now, you can see the dilation stage. So this would be pre-stage. And you can see here that you have a shifting um, of the fetus down. Now, just looking at this, you can see that you want the fetus to be in this situation. If it's breech, and let's say the feet are down here, then when we go into the next stage, which is the expulsion stage, we don't want those feet to come out first because what can happen is the hardest thing to come out is the head and then the shoulders. That's the hardest part to come out of the of the canal, out of the cervix and out of the canal. If the feet come out first, then you're at risk that the head gets stuck up here in the uterus. And the baby could, the fetus, I guess still at that point, could take in fluid and it could drown, potentially could take in some amniotic fluid. Also, what you're uh, worried about is the umbilical cord can wrap around the neck as you're trying to get the head out, that can start to strangle. So you have to be really careful if that fetus is in a breech position. Um, what they'll often do is, you know, as you're going in for visits, if they um, see that it is in a breech position, they'll do some massaging techniques to try to turn it around so that when labor actually starts, it's in this position. Some, you know, some fetuses, they just want to flip the other way, you know, so as much massaging as you do, they end up flipping by the time dilation stage occurs. That's the position you want to get in because that's the safest of all the positions. Once the head and the shoulders come out, the rest of it literally just shoots right out. I mean, it's just, boom, it's out quickly. So, takes you into the expulsion stage. <laughs> it's a pretty... I've been there a couple times, you know, catching down there. It comes out quick. Um, so the expulsion stage, at this point, you want the cervix completely dilated. So again, that would be 10 centimeters. They're going to tell you not to push until you get to 10 because, again, they don't want, you know, part of that fetus to come out and then the rest of it can't, or they don't want a bunch of tearing to happen. So they want you to get 10 centimeters and then the chance that it's gonna be able to come out easier is highly increased. This phase is gonna, again, begin when the cervix is fully dilated and it's gonna end once you get the fetus out. That's when this ends. This phase usually is less than two hours. So when you hear people having really long labors, it's that first stage. It's getting them to fully dilate. And I've always, my experience and from talking to people has always been, if you're going to go into a hospital setting, wait as late as possible. Get up, walk around, try to get gravity to help you get that cervix dilated. Do a lot of walking, you know, and, try to be active. A lot of hospitals, when you go in, they want to stick an IV in you and put you horizontal. And that slows the process down. So if you want to get that first stage you know, moving, then you want to be active and moving around as much as possible. Again, I've always heard, my experience has been, you know, once you get five minutes apart in terms of your contractions, then go in. But anything more than that, just don't bother because, you know, who wants to be in the hospital waiting for this to happen, right? So be active. 
in terms of this, this is when your contractions are going to be really intense. Okay? This is when you know women are like yelling at you or throwing things and that, that kind of stuff. That's usually this. The contractions are coming fast every couple minutes and they can last for a full minute. So a full minute of contractions doesn't seem very long, but if you're in you know, a full contraction, a full minute seems like a long time. And then you only have two minutes to kind of catch your breath and then boom, you're back into a contraction. And you know, if you're doing that for two hours, it can be, it can be challenging to be trying. Now, a lot of places will do what's called an episiotomy. And this is, they used to always just flat out do episiotomies. My um, experience is that they're trying to do them less now, but if they think that the vaginal canal is too small for the fetal head, then what they'll do is they'll make a cut through the perineal um, musculature. And so. What they're basically doing is they're, so what you want to avoid is if there is tearing, if the vaginal canal is too small for the head, you can end up having tearing going from the vagina all the way back to the anus. You can have tearing that whole area. And if you have a tear, usually the, the tear is ragged. It's not going to be clean. So what they'll do, if they think that that might happen, they'll do an episiotomy. So if, I know it sounds horrible, but you gotta think at that point, you really aren't gonna fill it. They're gonna give you a local and numb you, so you won't even notice it. You're so busy dealing with the contractions at that point, that's the least of your worries. And plus, you just wanna get it out, and anything that helps, you're okay. So if this is the vagina, and let's say that's the anus, then again, you want to avoid you know this kind of tearing kind of happening like that. So with an episiotomy, they would cut like this. They would just put a cut in there, and that would allow the vagina to open a little bit more. And that putting it in an angle here avoids the tear coming down to the anus. That this is a much harder wound to heal than suturing that up and letting it heal. This is much easier. I think they're mostly leg work just because. Are they? It was a big, it okay, used to be a big, easier. like, no, yes. we shouldn't do it, yeah, we should do it, and now they tend to just let you do this, like right? Yeah. yeah, let it rip. Yeah, let it rip, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, you know, a lot of this is really gonna depend on the size of the mom and then the size of that baby. Obviously, people have been doing this for millions of years without the help of, you know, drugs or scalpels, and, you know, for the most part, it turns out fine. So, so that's an episiotomy. It sounds more horrible than it probably is. Now, the other thing that can happen is C-sections can happen. And what a C-section is, is they're gonna cut through the abdominal wall. So they're gonna cut through here, cut through your abdominal muscles, connective tissue, and then cut into the uterus just enough to allow the infant's or the fetal head to come out. And again, once the head and shoulders are out, everything else comes out easily. Now, the problem with C-sections, this is major surgery. It's major surgery. And once you cut into these muscles, it's much harder for them to heal. Um, I shouldn't say that. They will heal, but it is hard to get them back to 100% of what they used to be in terms of their ability to generate a force of contraction. So if you've had one C-section, you're more likely then to need a C-section on subsequent pregnancies. Now, with C-sections, you are seeing the rate of C-sections increasing dramatically, I don't know, in the last maybe 10 years, five years, 10 years, and particularly in certain areas. If you go to Manhattan, it is very common for women to, I should say like business women, women with high-powered careers, it's very common for them to schedule when they're going to be induced, schedule a C-section, maybe schedule a, um, you know, kind of 
tuck up the vagina so it's nice and neat and pretty again, and then off they go. That's a very common thing to do. Again, the problem with that is, you know, once you've had a C-section, you're more likely to need another one, and it's major surgery. There's a lot more complications that can happen. Now, if, however, your fetus is in any kind of jeopardy during this vaginal delivery, then yes, a C-section is definitely warranted. The other problem with C-sections is you tend to see C-section numbers increasing like five o'clock on a Friday, right? When the physician or the staff, they want to make sure that they're home for their weekend or whatever. You tend to see the numbers of these jumping up. So you really have to be proactive in who is going to be with you during your delivery. You wanna make sure that they're gonna be giving you straightforward, honest suggestions and not benefiting their own lifestyle. The other problem with this, and I think we mentioned this before, is there is some question about do the oxytocin levels get high enough in mom and in the baby to facilitate the bonding process? Remember, oxytocin not only is making the muscle contract, but it's also facilitating the bonding that happens shortly after the, the delivery. <coughs> so the concern with C-sections is you don't have to let those oxytocin levels get high. You don't need to have the musculature contracting because you're going to go in and cut into it. So they're doing you know, some studies. I haven't seen the results to see that if um, people that do C-sections have a higher risk of postpartum depression. I don't know the results of this. Is there a, uh, <coughs> pretty sure there is, but at what point in the stage would it be too late to do a C-section? It's never too late to do a C-section. Oh, well, if I was just curious, because my mom was in labor with me for 64 hours, and by the time they realized, this is the story that I got, was by the time they realized they should have done a C-section, they couldn't, Actually, and so they had to suck me out with a vacuum. Okay, so let, let me take so that back. If you have curious. left the uterus, if you are well into leaving the uterus, then it probably is not a good idea to do it. So if the head is down here, and if they cut into the uterus, and they're <coughs> fearful that the head would get stuck here, then they wouldn't do it. Gotcha. But if there is some kind of problem, they can, if the baby, if the fetus gets stuck, they can use forceps to go in and kind of pull the baby out and then vacuum aspiration is very common also. Basically, you just put a big suction, vacuum suction here and try to pull it out. Um, but my understanding is that if the fetus is in distress and it can't come out vaginally, you can always do a C-section. Gotcha. Okay. Always. I don't know why that would be the case. I don't know. I haven't seen good studies that have linked anything together. That is one of those things that's going to be almost impossible to try to do cause and effect on because there are just so many factors. So, but I have seen things where they say, um, you know, not just C sections, but any kind of traumatic birth then that can lead to disruption in brain chemistry and lead to long-term you know, effects. Maybe not allergies, but you know, psychological effects and things like that. I, I just, I don't know. It could be possible, but it just doesn't seem very logical to me that a C-section would lead to an increased number of. I think what I heard was that the baby gets exposed to the bacteria Yeah, and maybe I would be I would be surprised that that one event is that critical for you know. Usually in biology, there's so much redundancy, and there's the ability to 
if one thing <coughs> doesn't work, then you have all these others, and especially for the immune system being such a complicated system. But I don't know. Maybe they'll they'll show it. But I had never seen anything that is very definitive, and it'll be a tricky one to prove. Okay, last, okay, so here's the expulsion stage and out it comes. And the last stage is the placental stage. So don't forget we've gotta get the placenta out as well. And so um, the uterus is still contracting and the placenta generally will come out within an hour of delivery. Usually, again, if you're in like a hospital setting, every time I've ever experienced this, Placenta comes out very quickly, um, within you know minutes, not like an hour. But generally, placenta comes out pretty pretty fast. And one thing you may notice in this stage is sometimes it looks like there's a lot of blood being lost, and and sometimes there is a lot of blood loss. But blood loss for mom is generally not a problem at this point, and. We've mentioned before that the placenta almost always tears on its way out, and the placenta is very vascular, and so there is gonna be bleeding. Now, you also have to remember that mom's blood volume during that pregnancy has increased by about 50%. She doesn't need that high blood volume anymore, so she can lose some blood and still be just fine. So this is why this blood loss is generally not a problem. Also, as the uterus is contracting, it's going to compress those blood vessels and it's gonna help them to decrease in diameter and that will help to decrease the blood loss as well. So, having a lot of blood loss, generally not a big issue, but out will come the placenta and the umbilical cord would still be attached unless they had cut it at that point. Now, once the baby is born, then obviously they will assess and they'll do, you know, they'll check the heart rate, the respiration, the color, you know, to make sure that CO2 levels aren't getting high, make sure oxygen is getting throughout the body, muscle tone and reflexes, you know, they'll give all of these different parameters a score, add them up, you know, if you're in this range, you've got a healthy baby, you know, anything lower, then they're gonna start doing further tests to see, is there a problem? Doesn't mean there's a problem, but it just means, eh, maybe we should look a little carefully, you know, look a little bit closer to see if there's some, some issue happening. Now, we've already talked about the first breath, so I'm not gonna go through that again. You guys are pretty familiar with that. The last thing up here is just lactation. And again, lactation is a positive feedback loop. And remember that for milk production, that is prolactin. Milk ejection is oxytocin. So after birth, if mom is going to breastfeed, and if you're trying to get, so think about the uterus is, is huge, right, during this pregnancy. The fetus comes out, the placenta comes out. The uterus is still kind of big. It takes a while for it to get back to its regular size. And usually what you do is you do some massaging techniques and that helps to, you know, get the uterus back to its, you know, normal size. But also, breastfeeding is a great way to help get the uterus back to its normal size. Because we're releasing oxytocin, and that oxytocin not only is going to stimulate the muscle cells here in the breast tissue, but they're gonna stimulate the uterus as well and help the uterus to contract and get back to its normal size. Now, in terms of what's happening with this loop, so there are a variety of different stimuli that's gonna trigger this. So, if you have a baby that is latching, the suckling, can activate mechanoreceptors there in the nipple area. And those mechanoreceptors, when they're activated, they're gonna send information, like any neural reflex we've talked about, along visceral sensory neurons, up to the hypothalamus, process that information. That's gonna cause more oxytocin to be released. 
the oxytocin then will come through the blood down here and stimulate the smooth muscle cells associated with the breast to contract, and that causes the milk to be ejected. The more the suckling is occurring, the, the, um, uh, the more that the milk is being ejected, the stronger the suckling. That sets up a positive feedback loop and the more oxytocin is released. Now, other things can activate this reflex as well. So hearing a baby cry, seeing a baby even, touching a baby, smelling a baby, all of those things that are happening in your cerebral cortex can activate this reflex because the cortex is sending inputs down to the hypothalamus. So you may get, you may be shopping and, you know, out somewhere and your baby not even with you, but you hear a baby crying. That could actually cause ejection to happen, milk ejection. Um, it can be, for some women, particularly women that have had multiple children, that reflex can be very strong. Some women, particularly with a first child, sometimes it's hard to get this reflex to kick in. And a lot of it's just patience and practice and you know, trying to get the right suckling technique to activate those receptors. For some women that have to go back to work, pumping can sometimes be difficult. For some women pumping, they have a hard time activating this reflex and ejecting milk. So what they'll often tell you to do is Bring in an audio of your baby. Bring in pictures of your baby. Set them there while you're, um, while you're pumping. And that can often help increase the milk production as well. So, I know you, some of you guys want to get out of here and I totally understand, so go. Anybody that has any questions, you're more than welcome to ask. Otherwise, I'll see you guys on Thursday.